Uh, this morning, I'd like to talk about breathing. Uh, last Wednesday, I gave all of us a homework assignment to do the body scan. And I'm not going to go, I, know, I don't know if I'm going to go into detail about what that means again, yet again this morning. We'll see, but I, do, I did want to speak about breathing. Breathing is integral to the, to the body scan. Breathing is integral to life. Uh, after the killing of George Floyd, a, a, a phrase, I can't breathe, was adopted as a political protest slogan, a very poignant slogan since uh, George Floyd and too many others lost their lives to brutality by not being able to breathe. And uh, it's been difficult for many people to breathe easy lately in our current world. And just psychologically, sociologically, it's been hard to breathe easy. So many things. And with this pandemic, with COVID-19, you know, it attacks, in the severe cases, in the life-threatening cases, it attacks the respiratory system, making it very, very difficult for folks to breathe. Breathing is so, it's the thread of our lives. Uh, there, you know, we need a constant uh, supply of, of air to sustain our lives. You know, without you know any significant interruption, we it's it's, it's essential. We can go for food for quite a while if we need to. People can fast for weeks sometimes. Water is a bit more essential. We can't go quite so long without water, but we could go a day or two or three and still survive. But the need for air is constant. The need to breathe is constant. And the word breath, uh, the word uh, respiration, the word respiration shares a root with the word inspiration. And that word is the Latin spiritus. So breath uh, historically has been associated with spirit, with human spirit and divine spirit. And the Latin spiritus, I don't know the Greek, but Hebrew, ruach, same thing. It means both breath and spirit, both human and divine. So the notion that you know breathing is something more than physical is uh, is has been a historical notion and an interesting notion, an interesting sense. The, there's something powerful about breathing, and uh, we can awaken to its power and and uh, allow, be nurtured by the power of, of breath. Another thing that's fascinating to me about breathing is it's both auton autonomic and not always autonomic. Autonomic is the, the, an automatic process of human physiology, like the heart rate. You know, the heart beats and we don't have to will it to beat. We don't have to think about think to make the, the heartbeat happen. And uh, some yogis can actually control their heart rate, for, but for most of us, we can't directly manipulate our heart rate, which I think is probably a good thing. It's a good thing that we don't have to exert our will to keep the heart going or we'd never be able to sleep. And likewise with the breath, you know, the breath will happen even when we're not thinking about it. The breath will happen even when we're not willing it, which is also a good thing. 
because we need that constant supply there. But with the breath, we can uh, control it. We can exercise, exercise our will to change it, to slow it down, to speed it up, to breathe in the chest or to breathe in the belly. It's amenable to our choices. It's amenable to our intervention, if you will. So the fact that it's both autonomic and also can be a willed thing is, is an interesting, you know, it, it exists in two realms. And how we relate to that fact can be important. If we relate to it unconsciously, uh, we, uh, for instance, uh, anxiety disorder. Uh, often the breath is tight and shallow and perhaps rapid, but one, one uh, treatment for anxiety disorder is when you notice severe anxiety to manipulate your breath, to breathe slower. Breathe deeper, breathe from the belly, and that can have you know that can have an effect on you know the tension in the body, and it, and it, just by the fact that you can intervene and consciously manipulate what otherwise would be going rapidly, and can have an effect on the whole whole picture for yourself. And uh, you can, I know in the work that I do is that I have to uh, move people in bed, I have to move their bodies. And sometimes their bodies are quite large <laughs> and uh, heavy. And it's always easier if I remember the breath. I breathe in and then I place my hands however they need to be. And then when I do the move, I exhale. And whenever I coordinate the breathing with the activity, it is easier. It is probably easier to turn the person if I do it with the breath. Fascinating to me how conscious breathing can um, be a benefit. And, and those reflections kind of give me a, an appreciation of why historically, the, you know, that uh, the breath was considered spirit as well as matter, as well as something physical, it was something, it's something spiritual. And, uh, you know, we use the breath in sadhana, in meditation, and we use it in the body scan and it's a very coordinating the practice with the breath is a powerful thing. And so coordinating the practice of meditating on the body with the breath is you know, a very, very good thing to do, a very important thing to do. Yesterday was a very busy day for me. And during my break, I was pretty exhausted. And uh, at first I was playing solitaire on my phone to relax from the break, but I didn't feel so relaxed. I was still you know, stressed from the work. So I actually put my head down on the table, like in kindergarten, taking a nap at your desk, but I didn't take a nap. I breathed into my torso, I breathed out and, uh, and it felt, what the, the feelings that were, that were there, especially in the back, in the lower back, and just settled into just doing that. And uh, that uh, eased some of the ten physical tension and, and calmed me mentally. And I very, found it very effective. So breathing, it's both autonomic and something that can be employed. And 
and there's a subtle relationship to that. So if we're, how do we bring the full dynamism of the breath into our conscious living? In Zazen, we often say, don't try to control your breath, just observe it as it is. That's a very common instruction and a good one. Um, if we're too heavy handed with manipulating the breath, we cut off the spirit, the spontaneity of the spirit that's inherent in the breath. But if we're totally unconscious of the breath, we're also kind of cut off from the nurturing spontaneity of the breath. You know, we're still getting the oxygen, but the vital ruach, the vital divine spirit requires awareness to really be nurtured by it. So over manipulation cuts us off from spirit. Unconsciousness cuts us off from spirit. And it's really challenging to be fully aware of breathing and not mess with it. It's hard to, hard to actually stay present to it with awareness and allow it to be spontaneous. That's a very interesting practice to, to just be aware of the breath and let it be what it is. On the other hand, uh, sometimes we recommend breathing from the belly. Uh, Suzuki Roshi would always encourage students to put strength in their belly, breathe from the belly. Uh, the hara in Japanese or the tantien in Chinese. Uh, and I don't know exactly the full meaning of the word tantien, but it has tien in it, which is a Chinese word for heaven. And so it's the gate of heaven, heavenly portal, I don't know exactly. But uh, that implication of spirit residing in the belly is a common one in the Asian cultures. And uh, I remember hearing that a Japanese person, I don't know if they were a Zen teacher or not, they said, you know, you Americans are crazy because you think with your heads, we Japanese think with our bellies. And you know, it's, I don't know if I agree entirely with that statement, but it's interesting to consider how often we associate consciousness with the head, the brain, and uh, ratiocination or discursive thought, that that's the seat of being. We just assume that so often. And the recommendation is to put the mind in the belly, put the seat of being in the belly, live from the belly. You know, thinking will still happen, but there'll be less uh, exclusive identification with it when we actually let the seat of consciousness uh, reside in the belly. So, well, this relationship between the autonomic nature of breath and the fact that we can access breath through awareness and even uh, consciously, I don't like the word manipulate, but consciously affect the, the pattern and the nature of breathing. So in sitting, I would say that, you know, primarily be aware of the breath. You know, make you know, breath uh, the focal point of practice. And uh, allow it to sink into the belly. Invite it to sink into the belly. Don't force it. But it feels good. Like just there, I took a deep in-breath with the belly and I could, my knees tingled in a pleasant way. I don't know if that's the blood oxygenating the muscle tissues or what have you, but it feels good when we invite the breath to settle into the belly. It feels, you know, don't force it. Don't, you know, you know, with, with excessive manipulation, control the breath in the belly, but to invite it into the belly. And, you know, water seeks its lowest place kind of thing. It, it, it loves to flow down there when we kind of like 
hold the, hold the torso in such a way that the belly is open and not constricted and then allow the, allow the breath to, to flow into the lowest place. And it does so quite naturally, quite pleasantly. So that I'm trying to get a feeling for, or find words to express a feeling of, allow it to be itself, you know, don't control, control it completely. Let the, the autonomic quality of it be present so the, the spontaneity that nurtures us in, in creation in, in, in the moment is present. You know, give it some freedom, but bring awareness to it. And with a gentle invitation, allow it to seek the place in the belly so that you're both fully conscious but you're not cutting off the, spontane the spontaneous life force that transcends will. You're allowing that to be present as well. So you're what it's kind of a razor's edge of awareness. You're not controlling the show, but you're not tuning out either. And you and through presence, through receptivity, you're inviting the, the breath to be its best without trying to control it. So that's a whole lot of words about breathing from the belly and, and creating the context that will allow that to happen. You know, we're bringing full awareness to the breath. Um, now back to the body scan, for, for, for instance, as an example, we're doing body awareness practice. And uh, what in the body scan form of body meditation, you know, we systematically uh, scan with awareness the, the entirety of the body step by step, starting at the top of the head, working down. And uh, one of the recommendations that's offered is to breathe through the area under contemplation. For instance, say the, the area of the eyes and the musculature behind the eyes. When you get to that point, the instruction is to breathe through the eyes. And it's analogous to in yoga practice, when you're doing a certain asana and you, you know, you're stretching a certain muscle or group of muscles, the instructor will say, feel the stretch, breathe through the stretch breathe into the, the point part of the body that's feeling the stretch then back off a little bit breathe into the area exhale and see if you can sink a little bit deeper into the pose breathing into the parts that are stretching and that's you know very even though physically you're not doing that physically the air is not coming through the skin around the eyes something is happening by visualizing breathing through the area, something happens, excuse me. And similarly with the body scan, you know, if we have the instruction breathe through the eyes, that instruction unites the breath and the awareness and very dynamic focus as to what is really going on. One is very present with the situation around the eyes in this instance, what's happening, what the muscles feel like. One is practicing deep solidarity, if you will, with, with one's eyes. And just by being present, not trying, and in the same instruction, we say, you know, just observe what's there. Don't try to change anything. You can invite it to relax, but don't try to make it relax. You can't try to make it relax. But by the mere fact of that solidarity of presence with exactly what's happening with the eyes and the musculature around the eyes, a release almost can't not happen. Excuse the double negative. You know, it, it just, you know, it's, it just happens. If you're really, really present, then 
whatever unconscious muscular tension might have been present just spontaneously releases. So likewise with the, I think with the invitation to breathe in the belly, you know, just by making that invitation, it just happens because the, the breath really loves to happen in the belly. Good, thing, good things happen. Like earlier when I was talking about moving the patient, I breathe in down here and then I exhale from, from the ten, tantian, the tandem. If I did it up here, <laughs> it would probably be constrictive and not so effective, but I go like that and it's much easier to, to, to perform the, the move. So doing the, doing the practice of the body scan, if you imagine taking, for example, the eyes or the shoulders, just to change the example for, for the sake of change. If you imagine breathing through the shoulders with the musculature that you're contemplating, but pulling the breath from the belly. So, you know, it's coming in through the shoulders, but, but being pulled from the belly. And that can be very effective. So I encourage you to live on that razor's edge of the breath. It's kind of a razor's edge in a certain sense. Can't, we can't live without it for very long. We have to either stay on this planet or take it with us because this planet has a very thin little layer of air around it, you know, we're, you know, very, very thin, you know, and we're underneath it, we're inside of it, and if we're outside of it, we're goners, unless we t take some air with us somehow, as I said, and when we walk around on our planet, and we see the vegetation, the trees, and all, all beings that photosynthesize, we recognize that they're helping to produce that little thin layer of the source of life, the moment by moment source of life for us that, you know, that, that we have to stay connected with. Razor's edge of breath. If we don't have it going on, even for a little while, we suffer and, and eventually we would die. And the razor's edge of awareness, such a phenomenal fact of breath, so vital. You know, we want to allow it to be spontaneous. We want the force of its spontaneity to nurture us. And if we're too heavy handed with manipulating it, we cut ourselves off from that. It needs to have some spontaneous life to it and not be contrived or controlled excessively. But if we don't observe it at all, if we, if we cut it out of our awareness, it could be tight, it could, we could hyperventilate when we're nervous. It's important to be conscious, to breathe consciously at least a good portion of the time. Not all the time, you know, not when we're sleeping, not when other things dominate, need to dominate our awareness, but there are so many times when we could have this miraculous fact of breath part of our conscious living that, that perhaps we're not taking advantage of, like walking walking, standing, wonderful thing to, when standing, breathe through the soles of your feet. Once again, visualize taking breath up through the soles of your feet. Uh, in martial arts and Tai Chi, they sometimes talk about that, to ground yourself, you know, breathe through the, the there's a certain, I forget the name, but there's a name for the, the instep. So it's, it has a uh, point to it. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> it, it has a, a significance, and that significance is connected to the breath, just like the Tantian is the significance is connected to the breath. You know, 
and you know it's so effective to to employ the breath to nurture you to nurture yourself and i, I do it at work you know uh healthcare is a stressful occupation <laughs> it's getting more stressful lately and uh when i feel you know when i'm anxious and i'm in my head about how many things i have to do or you know how things are going and my breath is in my chest and i if i catch myself and open up and let the breath sink into the belly and just let everything else drop for a moment or two for a breath or two and just feel my body and the whole nervous system amps down the, the noise in the head quiets it doesn't disappear entirely but it's not so charged and, and and i can it's almost like when i do that i can feel the blood being oxygenated and and, nur and nourishing the, the the tissues i don't know if that's true but it feels like something really good is happening physiologically when i stop for just a breath or two feel the breath feel the body you know, if we have presence of mind to employ this, it's a very effective intervention when things get heated, when we feel stressed, when the RPMs of our mind and body are, are hitting that red zone, we do this practice, the needle drops down. And breath is key to do that, uniting with the breath, becoming one with the breath. And when we start looking at uh, stage three of the fourfold schema, the schema of finding your seat, inhabiting the body, which is what I've been talking about with the breath pretty much, uh, training the puppy and letting go. Stage three, training the puppy, which means practicing with discursive thought. Uh, training the puppy is, you know, calming the mind, settling the thinking mind, shamatha, calm abiding, where the mind is not, you know, like a puppy just running around crazy, or like the monkey swinging from branch to branch. The monkey mind is an expression of Zen, swinging from branch to branch to branch. It stays. You know, that's Pema Chodron's expression for training the puppy, stay, stay. In, in uh, calming the mind, so it's not running about all the time, but is abiding on a point of observation. That's the meaning of shamatha, abiding, a calm abiding upon an object of meditation. The object that we use most, you know, in Zen, pretty much exclusively, and in Buddhism, there are other possibilities, but the, the breath is one of the primary ones. Abiding with the breath. When we come to that stage, when we start to look at that stage, uh, an interesting instruction is in Zen Mind Beginner's Mind, where Suzuki Roshi says, uh, concentration is not to try hard to watch something. If you try to keep your mind on one spot, you'll be tired in about five minutes. That's not concentration. So remember this notion of allowing the spontaneity of the breath to nurture us. So we don't want to control it too heavily, but we don't want to ignore it. We want to be in a dynamic partnership with the breath. When he says it's not to try hard to concentrate uh, to keep your mind on something, I think he's talking about the same thing. If we're too heavy handed, we cut ourselves off from the, the dynamic quality of spontaneity, of things beyond our control that's part of our living. He says in Zazen, we say the mind follows the breathing. But the way to keep your mind on your breathing is to forget all about yourself and just sit and feel your breathing. If you forget about yourself, you feel your breathing. If you feel your breathing, you'll forget about yourself. He says, I don't know which comes first. 
So in using the breath for discursive thought to uh, have some measure of freedom from that incessant running inner dialogue, the practice is to just be the breath. You know, you, 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 uh, how to say it? You're, you're nothing but the breathing. You, know, you, 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 know, you forget about yourself and just feel the breathing activity, the living activity of the breath as the only thing. Which at the same time, it was at the center of everything. It's the only thing, but there's also the sound of the traffic. There's also a thought that pops up now and then, but the seat of the breath is, is not left. And the seat of the breath is just the awareness of breathing. You just feel the breath. If you feel your breath, you'll forget about yourself. If you forget about yourself, you can feel your breath. I don't know which comes first. This, this is the, the very interesting pivot that is all about stage three, all about training the puppy is this pivot, a point of pivot, where if you forget about yourself, you'll feel your breathing. If you feel your breathing, you'll forget about yourself. That there's a pivot there. How to speak about that pivot? Because I'm introducing step three a little bit this morning. How to experience that pivot? Well, it's analogous to, you know, I, I talk about when, I'm a, when I was a kid and I'd be watching TV. Uh, Felix the Cat was one of my favorite cartoons. And all of a sudden I'd hear my mom, Rick! And she'd been calling my name for quite some time. But until I heard her shout it, I didn't hear it. <laughs> you know, I was just absorbed by Felix. And finally, the decibel level reached high enough level to where I could hear her. And because, you know, I was engrossed in Felix the cat and I didn't hear that she was calling, you know, my name, trying to get my attention. In Genjo Koan, uh, uh, Dogen says the following, he says, uh, hang on a second. When you see forms and hear sounds, fully engaging body and mind, you grasp things directly. When you see forms or hear sounds, fully engaging body and mind. Forgetting about yourself and just feeling the breathing. When you when you see forms, hear sounds, fully engaging body and mind, you grasp things directly, okay? Now, the next thing he says, he says, unlike objects and their reflection in a mirror, and unlike the moon and its reflection in the water, when one side is illuminated, the other side is dark. So, when and so that phrase, you know, see, when you see forms or hear sounds, fully engaging body and mind, you grasp things directly. You know, you're, you're samadhi, you're fully, you know, you forget about yourself and just feel the breathing. Which means when one side is illuminated, the other side is dark. Unlike objects in the mirror and the moon and the water, you can't see Felix the cat and hear your mom at the same time. You know, you can't be preoccupied with your subjectivity and be with things at the same time. This is a pivot. And usually we're so adept at vacillating quickly between one and the other, we think we can think and be conscious of the spontaneity of the moment at the same time, but actually we're just vibrating very, very fast. To really hear music, 
you have to forget about yourself and just be the music for as long as the music lasts which is, you know, what T.S. Eliot says in Four Quartets. Music that's heard so deeply that it's not heard at all, but, but you are the music for as long as the music lasts. To really hear the music, you have to forget about yourself and just become the music. If you're ruminating about things, the music can't really get through. It's not really fully actualized. It's kind of fuzzy and, and unclear and becomes an echo of your own thinking instead of the, the vital, vital happening. So that's the pivot that, uh, that Suzuki Roshi and Dogen are talking about. And, and when working with discursive thinking, the most important thing is not to be skillful at stopping discursive thinking. You know, that's not so important. The important point is to study that pivot, to notice when you're actually forgetting about yourself and just feeling the breath and what that feels like and the settledness and the groundedness and the ease that that can promote when the incessant churning of the thinking, there's a break and that break has qualities of ease and spaciousness. So you feel what it's like to forget about yourself and just sit and breathe. And then you feel what it's like to lose that in discursive thought. And that this is a very distinct feeling, you know, when the mind is churning, you're no longer just breath. And you're not in your body anymore in a sense. You're, you're, in, you're in subjectivity, you're in thinking, you're in concept, you're in past or future. And then, and then, and your actual spontaneous being is dark because concept, past and future ideas is illuminated. When you just feel your breath, that is very bright and dynamic. And, and then the thinking is dark. It, it, it has a different quality. It's no longer you. It's something that is just part of the spontaneity of what's happening. When we don't chase after thoughts, they're just part of the spontaneity of what's happening. They're part of this one whole being, this uh, Zenki, the whole works of the, of the fullness of the moment. And so the breath is key to, to uh, studying the pivot. And studying the pivot is more important than facility at stopping discursive thought. The, the facility at stopping discursive thought is useful. You know, being able, you know, having a deeper quality of concentration, samadhi, stability of mind, that's, you know, a useful tool. But Tools are useful in how you employ them. You can use a hammer to drive a nail or smash a piece of pottery if you don't use it correctly. How do you use the tool concentration? Study the pivot. Study this place of, if you forget about yourself, you'll feel your breathing. If you feel your breathing, you'll forget about yourself. When one side is illuminated, the other side is dark so engrossed in watching Felix the Cat that I don't hear until I do. And then there's a pivot, you know, when one side is illuminated, the other side is dark. Studying a different ontological quality of being. It's a different quality of being. And they're not, and it's not one is bad and one is good. They're different is all. But we've become, we become habituated to self and other. We become habituated to subject and object to the extent that sometimes we presume that's all that reality is. But when we, but when we stop and take a break, return to where we are, we see that there's a depth of being that is inaccessible to subject-object orientation. 
So you, so in stage three of training the puppy, the point is to feel the ease of your being by being able to navigate the pivot. Just sit, you know, the way to keep your mind on your breathing is just to sit and feel your breathing. If you feel your breathing, you'll forget about yourself, which is a good thing. If you forget about yourself, you can feel the breathing. I don't know which comes first, he says. Then he goes on to say, if you continue this practice, eventually you will realize the true existence which comes from emptiness. The true existence which comes from emptiness. Everything is fresh and new. Creation didn't happen 2,000 years ago or, or however many years ago biblical Christians say it did or creation did begin five billion years ago, whatever the astronomers and, and physicists say, creation is happening now, eternally, ever, now. That's, that's called uh, Ziran in Chinese, um, and Zaohua is another related term, the spontaneity of creation, perpetually, spontaneously coming into being, fresh and new, moment by moment by moment. That's what Suzuki Roshi is talking about. If you continue this practice, eventually you'll experience the true existence, which comes from emptiness. The spontaneity of being alive. Right now we're alive. It's such a remarkable fact that we neglect with busyness and to-do lists and stresses and melodramas. Because we're always, we tend to be always engaged in that discursive subject creating, self-creating illusion a mechanism of discursive thought. We buy into that as true. It's 100% fabrication. <laughs> we make it all up. What's true right now is inexpressible. And it's always happening, fresh and new, moment by moment by moment. It's wondrous, it's fast. And it, just studying that pivot, when you forget about yourself, Wow, I'm alive, I'm breathing. So that's just a little bit about, you know, keep breathing, <laughs> keep breathing. Appreciate breath. It's so precious and it hangs by a thread. It's the thread of our being. And it's been put in jeopardy politically. Now it's been put in jeopardy pandemically. Maybe not neglect to appreciate the fact that we're alive and able to breathe. <laughs>